to me. It was kind of a miracle. I was actually scheduled to somewhere else at my own church, but then I switched it for last week, and that was a miracle too, because for the first time ever, my laptop decided not to work that morning last week. In the morning, it just wouldn't come on. And uh, the lights would come on on the keyboard and everything, but the screen wouldn't come on. And so uh, my wife was praying, I was praying, and then I took the computer apart. Never done that before either. And pulled out wires and plugged them back in because I don't know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> so, and uh, then uh, after a bunch of prayers and everything, all of a sudden the computer came on. And so I have no idea. My, my boys think I'm a computer genius now, but it's not true. <laughs> it's just like, and then, I, actually coming down here, there's another miracle because after the talk last week, we went out into the woods and hiked around. And uh, the next day, I, I looked like that. No. I came down with poison oak. So, and my boy still looks like that right now. Wesley, my oldest boy, 12 years old. So I was like, I might have to cancel this thing. So I called my brother-in-law, Roger. He's been here before, Roger Schwalt. And he ordered me a heavy-duty course of steroids. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> otherwise, I'd look like that today. And I, I could barely talk, actually, only on the side of my mouth. My wife thought I was a different person. But anyway, so there's a bunch of miracles for me being here. So uh, it's just nice to be here. And it's nice to feel like almost normal. I, People at work thought I was like having a great vacation out some sunny place and I got sunburnt. But that's not what happened. I got poison oak. I wish I had a better story. But. So what is science? This is the thing. When I was in the Army, um, I grew up in the Adventist church. My dad's a pastor. I was in the Adventist ghetto all my life. And then I went to medical school and after medical, and at Loma Linda. So that's sort of an Adventist ghetto. And uh, then I went to the Army. And the first time when I... All my friends were not Adventists, and, and everybody I hung out with was not Adventist. And they started asking me questions that I didn't know the answer to, that not even my parents, no, no, my teachers throughout all my schooling, including college and medical school, had no idea how to answer these questions that I was being asked. You know, why in the world are you, you know, consider yourself, you know, a sort of a scientist, at least you appreciate science, and yet you're a creationist that's like, a conundrum for these people. And it was for me too, I could not answer their questions and I was, I, I was kind of shaken uh, by their questions and the, and the fact that nobody was able to answer these questions that I knew. And so I had to kind of look for it myself, you know, how do I answer these questions for myself? And I was kind of nervous because I was like, if I can't answer these questions, I'm, I might have to actually leave the church, right? Which is a big deal if your dad's a pastor. That's, well, we knew it all along. He's a pastor's kid. What do you expect? Right? <laughs> but I, I was kind of nervous about this. And, but then I started out with genetics because that's what I knew most about. And I started getting excited because the stuff I learned uh, seemed to confirm more and more and more. The more I studied it, the more it confirmed what the Bible was saying and not what I was hearing from secular scientists. So science is just a basic mechanism to think about the world, to test it, to evaluate it, and to learn. You use the past to predict the future. It's not very complicated. The only complicated thing about it is, is you have to be willing to be wrong in science. You have to be willing to test your, your predictions of the future in a way that you can be wrong. So they're falsifiable predictions. And that's basically it. So, but there's scientists who, who go beyond this mechanism, this method, and uh, they call themselves, or people call them, methodological philosophical naturalists. And so what is methodological naturalism? It says God can still exist, but he's not considered when studying the natural world. You make your scientific theories, but you never invoke angels or miracles or anything like that. It has to be perfectly explainable by mindless natural processes, no miracles involved. Philosophical naturalism is atheistic. It's like, well, we can't detect God at all, and so he must not exist, so therefore we're, we're atheists. Those are philosophical naturalists. So what do they say about themselves? Here's uh, J.B.S. Haldane. He's a British-born scientist, died in 1964. He's known for his work in philosophy, um, physiology, genetics, evolutionary biology, and mathematics. Pretty well known in his own day. And he says, my practice as a scientist is atheistic. That is to say, when I set up an experiment, 
I assume that no god or, you, or angel or devil is going to inter interfere with its course. And this assumption has been justified by such success as I've achieved in my professional career. I should therefore be intellectually dishonest if I were not also atheistic in the affairs of the world. So that's his reason for being an atheist. And also Arthur Strahler, um, he, he wrote a book actually critiquing scientific creationism called Science and Earth History in 1987. He said, if science must include supernatural realm, it would be forced into a game where there are no rules. Without rules, no scientific observations, explanations, or predictions can enjoy a high probability of being correct, the correct picture of the world. So that's why he's an atheist. And uh, anybody know of Nietzsche? Frederick Nietzsche he says, is man merely a mistake of the gods, or is God merely a mistake of man? So it's, he, he believed that the idea of God was just a human creation. There's no, it's not helpful at all in describing the real world. And Richard Dawkins, of course, famous evolutionary biologist and atheist. Gods are fragile things. They may be killed by a whiff of science or a dose of common sense. So this is what my friends in the army were telling me. Right? How can you even have common sense and believe like you believe? Right? So it's kind of a nerve-wracking thing if you don't know the answers to things. So what does the Bible say? At least uh, let's look on the other side of things and then we'll see where the evidence lies or where the evidence lands. The Bible pulls no punches. I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward language. It's a, it calls people foolish. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. You're basically an idiot, according to the Bible, if you don't believe in God. And... Uh, and David writes even about the stars. These, these, are, these aren't stars, these are galaxies. And we'll talk about these a little later. There's about two trillion galaxies in the visible universe. And each one has about a, well, the Milky Way has between 100 billion and 400 billion stars in it. So the heavens declare the work of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words anyway. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. And so what's David trying to say here? That you can look at the sky and detect the signature of God, is what he's trying to say. And then uh, Paul says the same thing, basically. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. In fact, it's so clear that you're an idiot if you can't see it, is what Paul is saying. Right? And so all these brilliant scientists, Richard Dawkins and Thaler and all these other guys, they're idiots, according to Paul. You should be able to clearly see it. Right? <laughs> so Peter says the same thing. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. So Peter is basically saying they're scoffing because they desire something evil. That's why they scoff, not because of lack of evidence, let's say. They will say, where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestor died, everything goes on it has, it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget, this is not an accident, that's something they strive for. They deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So who's right? Here's we got these two claims, each both sides calling the other side idiots, right? So who's right? So I like to look at it. There's this story of uh, turtles all the way down, where a scientist goes and he's giving a lecture uh, to kind of a general public, and at the end of his lecture, a lady stands up in the back, an Indian lady, American Indian, and she says, "You got it all wrong. That's not how the world came into being at all." And he's like, "Well, how did it come into being?" And she's kind of playing along. And she says, well, it was built on the back of a turtle. And then he said, well, she's going to play along with her. He said, well, what's the turtle standing on? And he says, don't be smart with me, young man. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I look at it, too. Uh, the, which direction are the turtles going? Because scientists also have a turtle problem. They, can't talk, they, they don't know anything about the first turtle. right? And neither creationists like me, uh, I don't know how to explain God either. 
if I knew how to explain God, I, I would need God, I would be God, right? So there's certain mysteries about God that I don't know, right? But there's also mysteries on the other side that they don't know. So how can we tell which is right? Is it turtles all the way down or is it turtles all the way up? So can we at least tell which direction the turtles are going, right? So that's how I, 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 I try to break things down into simple things that I can understand. So let me ask you guys, let's look at some natural stuff and see if you can tell if it's designed or not. These are crystals, salt crystals, snowflakes, pyrite crystals, designed or natural? Intentionally designed or can these be formed by natural mechanisms, mindless mechanisms? They're natural, right? At least they, now could they have been designed? Can someone just sit there and chisel out a piece of ice to look like a snowflake? If they take a lot of time and effort, they could. So it could be designed, but it also could be natural, right? How about this, natural or design? River rocks or whatever? Well, they, these are actually designed because they're fake rocks, right? So <laughs> they're designed to look natural, right? So I'm trying to tell. So natural things can be designed, but uh, the other way around is not so easy. How about this? These are, this is granite cubes highly symmetrical granite cubes that, that are used in industrial applications for precise measurement. Designed or natural? Designed, right? A highly symmetrical polished granite cube doesn't happen in nature like that. In fact, if a Mars rover came across one of these things on the surface of Mars, like a, a three meter by three meter precise polished granite cube on the surface of Mars, it would hit the front page of every newspaper in the world, right? Oh, aliens have been discovered. How would they know? because they know that that doesn't happen naturally, right? How about this? Is this designed or natural? It's designed because it says planting the natural garden, right? <laughs> so, you, so how about this, designed or natural? Who would believe that a hurricane picked up all the seeds from the natural garden and just planted them just like that, they grew up like that by themselves, right? No one would believe that. Everybody, if you found this on an alien planet, you would still know it's designed. Right? How about this, driftwood on the beach? Designed or natural? Looks natural, right? Could have been, I could have just piled them up there to look natural, like creating a natural driftwood pile. How about this? Design, no one would, not even Richard Dawkins would get confused here, right? So I just like these things, these are pretty cool. Driftwood horses, designed or natural? Looks, nat looks natural, right? How about them? Design. You walk along the beach, you come across this, you're like, someone was here before me, not some hurricane, right? Right. Same thing. You're walking down the creek, and all of a sudden you come across this, designed or natural? Designed, right? No one be confused, not even Richard Dawkins. I hate to pick on him, but he, he asked for it. <laughs> designed or natural? Design. I just like these things. You know, if you found... Uh, pyramids on Mars, again, you would still say some alien intelligent did this. How about this, designed or natural? This was my boy Wesley's first family portrait. <laughs> I'm the one with the big head, right? <laughs> so that's me. But you know, it doesn't have to be like high quality necessarily. It doesn't have to be extremely precise for you to tell that it's designed. You know that this isn't some hurricane who did this, some random scribbling of some worm or whatever. This was designed. Even though it's not, I mean, it gets a little better. This is Bradley's first family portrait. <clears throat> I got the big hair. <laughs> so, and this is me and mama holding hands. So you can still tell it's designed. This is Bradley's first shark. So you can tell it's designed, right? It didn't just happen by itself. And this is Wesley's blue dog. And uh, I think it's pretty good because this is Picasso's dog. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I like Wesley's dog better myself. Right? So, and everybody knows Picasso designed it, right? It, but Wesley, I think, is on his way. All right, designed or natural? Design, no one has any problem with this. Design or natural? Design, I, designed or natural? <laughs> this is from a little jumping insect called Isis Cleopterus, and it, 
and it jumps with such acceleration, 400 times the force of gravity. And in order to do that, it has to have gears in its legs to synchronize its jump, right? This is the first discovery of natural gears, right? Now, if all the other gears that you just said were designed, why not this? They work just like gears and whoop, there he goes, flying off. Now, what's the difference? How are these not designed? How did they just come about with mindless processes? These are, uh, this is a screw joint for a, a knee of a beetle, a weevil, and it's and it, like a lock and screw, like a bolt and a screw, and it just screws in like, like regular. This is, uh, anybody know what this is? This is a fungus that grows on cow dung in the field. Right? But it's very technically precise. It, uh, the little, it's like a cannonball, the little black thing on the tip shoots off super fast at two meters. Um, it can travel up to two meters. It speeds up to 25 meters per second or one million times their own length in one second. 20,000 times the force of gravity with sp some species up to 180,000 times the force of gravity. A rifle bullet only travels at 9,000 times the force of gravity. Right, so, and, and it's uh, light directed, like it senses where the light is, so it, it follows the sun, so it knows not to like shoot straight down, right? So it can shoot far off because it needs to get its spore somewhere for a cow to eat it, to then, you know, propagate itself. So it has, it's all, and it can't just have it like the, the fluid underneath of it, it can't just be randomly oriented, it has to be very precisely built. Otherwise it won't work. It has to be extremely, it's like a finely tuned cannon machine. And it's not even better than a rifle bullet as far as gravitational forces are concerned. And this is kind of a time-lapse picture. It just shoots off like a jet propulsion. And here's poof, slow motion, boom. How about this, designed or natural? Do you know what this is? I thought this was really cool. This is a an egg from a spider, and he builds a fence around it to keep the ants away. It's a barbed wire fence built by a spider. Do you think this, what happened when the spider decided to first make the fence? It's like, hmm, maybe you only put one strand around. And it didn't work, right? It's, it's all or nothing, guys. You have to put enough strands for it to be effective. And the spider's not gonna come up with this all by itself. It had to be told what to do. Right? It's just a, you can't do this slowly either. It's like all or nothing. And this is very precise. It's like a barbed wire fence. It's got like seven strands on it. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, designed or natural? <laughs> Again, it doesn't have to be. There, there, there are spectrums of design, is what I'm trying to say. You can, just because you're on the low end of the spectrum doesn't mean it's not designed, right? High end of the spectrum, still designed, right? Let's say, I've, let's say I made a spaceship like this that, uh, that goes back in time, right, or whatever. It can do spectacular, it can go faster than the speed of light, something. Something that I can't explain. If I still found it and it worked and it functioned like that, I don't necessarily have to know how it works to know that it's designed. You know, understand? It's on a spectrum, and the spectrum can quickly go beyond my feeble brain, right? But I can still tell it's designed. Right? So I don't have to understand everything about it to know that it's designed. I can't even build the space shuttle, but I know it's designed. Right? God-like creative power. So eventually, once you get beyond my feeble brain, very quickly things become God-like. It's like, well, I don't understand it, but it's designed. Right? So that's how I, I view things. This is interesting about the Earth, and so about the fine-tuned features of the Earth. This is a beam of light from the sun, looking back from the Voyager, that's way far away, and in the beam of light, there's this little blue dot. So, the pale blue dot. So, if you see this little streak way out there, that's, that's the sun, and that's the beam of light. And in that beam of light, the farthest one over, there's a little tiny blue dot, and um, here you go, right there. And that's the Earth. Right? Taken from Voyager 1, 1990, from about 3.7 billion miles away. All right? So it, does, it looks like a, a 
floating dust, a fragment of dust. That's all we are here on this planet, uh, relative to the whole universe. And that this is everything is on that tiny little blue dot. And, uh, and then you look at the precision of that blue dot. And you're just like, what care was taken in putting that together? And also, out of the universe itself, out of the two trillion galaxies in the universe, we're inside a, I was just watching this, you know, the, the Milky Way is between 100 billion and 400 billion stars. And uh, it's about 100,000 light years across. It's a pretty decent sized galaxy that we live in. But if we were located inside the middle of the galaxy somewhere, we wouldn't be able to see out and study the universe. We'd just see a bunch of haze and stars. And if we were even in one of the arms of the galaxy, we wouldn't be able to see out very well and study the universe. And we wouldn't actually have enough heavy metals uh, to make the building blocks of life either if we we're not in this perfect Goldilocks zone within our own galaxy. And so we're located between two arms, between the uh, well, it's hard. I don't even have a laser pointer. Anyway, between two of the arms, about two thirds of the way out, that's where we exist. So, how much attention? Oh, there we are. Uh, how much attention? So, it's in the perfect spot within the galaxy. Also, they've looked at the orbit. Of, the orbit of the Earth is almost perfectly spherical. It's not uh, a circular, perfect, almost perfect circle. None of the other planets are like that. Also, they've looked at, also the Earth's distance from the sun is in this perfect green zone where it's not too hot, not too cold. And uh, the planets that they discovered, they've, they've found planets around other star systems, uh, hundreds of them so far, and none of them have had the orbit that's perfectly circular like this where, that it could support life. Because if you have an elliptical orbit, it would get too hot, too cold, too hot, too cold, right? Even if you're in the right zone some of the time. It, you have to have pretty well all the time perfect. Otherwise, you just wipe things out. Also, we have ma a magnetic protection from the solar radiation, and it protects us from getting stripped off. If we didn't have this, if there was no magnetic protection, it would strip off all the atmosphere. It would be gone. Right? So we have to have this uh, inner iron core twirling around to give us magnetic protection to make life on this planet. Also, the moon has to be the, the right size and distance from the Earth to keep the oceans uh, oxygenated and moving and everything doesn't get stale and die. Also, the, Earth, the moon keeps the Earth in its proper tilt orbit. Otherwise, the, the Earth would tilt back and forth wildly all the time, and that would mess things up. No other planet does that. Also, it, it's good that we just have one moon. If we had a bunch of moons rotating around randomly, it would screw things up. Also, the moon is exactly the right uh, size and distance so that it perfectly blocks out the sun during eclipses, and you can see the halo around it. If it was just a tiny bit bigger or a tiny bit smaller, we couldn't study the sun as effectively as we do now. So it's just very fortunate that you can see it just perfectly it blocks it out. It's like, that's like a setup. The sun itself is the uh, perfect age, perfect brightness, perfect distance. Everything's perfect about it to sustain life on this planet. Jupiter. Without Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is the solar system's vacuum cleaner. Without Jupiter, we'd get blasted by uh, a bunch of asteroids and meteors and get and that doesn't work very well either. That's probably what caused the flood. We'll talk about that later. Without Jupiter, life wouldn't be, at least complex life wouldn't exist here. Also, um, water, the, well, animals and plants back and forth. You have to have both to make oxygen, you know, um, plants breathe out the oxygen, we breathe out the carbon dioxide, and we exchange. Without both, life wouldn't work. Complex life anyway. Same thing with water. Water has a lot of unique aspects to it. It takes a lot of heat to raise the temperature of a gram of water relative to any other material on the planet. Um, takes, uh, water has an absorption of 4,000 joules of heat for the temperature of one kilogram of water to increase one degree Celsius. For comparison, it only takes 385 joules or uh, 
a sixth of the amount, I guess, or less than that, of heat to raise one kilogram of copper one degree Celsius. Um, and water also <laughs> what makes our dot blue. It's a universal solvent. It's less di dense as a solid because if the uh, ice was more dense than the, than the water itself, it would sink instead of float on the top. And then as it sunk, it would kill all the fishes and it would just build up thicker and thicker during the winter time and it wouldn't work, it would kill everything. So it's nice that it's less dense. Um, it wor works a lot better that way. It can exist as a solid liquid and gas within a relatively narrow range of temperatures. It's only natural chemical compound on Earth's surface that can do this. And we already talked about the specific heat. Um, it also has a higher surface tension and capillary action, which means that trees, big tall trees, can suck it up to the top, right? You can't do that with like mercury. It doesn't work. And uh, I mean, water just has amazing qualities that allow for, the, for life to exist on this planet. Also, the universe itself is finely tuned uh, to allow for complex life to exist in the universe. The Big Bang itself had to be extremely precise. All the parts that exist in the universe had to have a very low entropic state to begin with. In other words, they had to be precisely placed. And the precision of the placement has been calculated to be at least one in 10 to the power of one E123. Now that's an enormous, well, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny number, or one followed by one E, one in 23 zeros. And you're like, well, you can't really wrap your mind around that number except there's 10 to the 80th atoms in the visible universe. If you wanted to write this number down, you'd have to write one E 40 zeros, zero, 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 uh, one E 40, 40, uh, it's hard to even explain that, on every single atom to write down the number for this in the universe. So it's, it's an extremely precise number. So there's also a lack of antimatter in the universe, talk about that in a minute. And uh, there's precisely balanced atomic charges with masses. All these things have to be very precisely balanced or else complex life could not exist. And Newton didn't even know about most of these things, but he said the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent, powerful being. And um, he's one of my more favorite scientists. We'll talk about him in a little bit more. Brandon Carter, 18, uh, 1974, started listing off these things. He said the universe is a very delicately balanced place. 38 at the time, 38 precisely interacting features. And now there's about 150 by the Matt, end of... your phone needs a mobile or Wi-Fi connection oh. first. It's trying to talk to me. I hate it when it listens to me. Like that. <laughs> All right. So there's a bunch of these finely tuned features without which any one of these things, life would, complex life would not exist. So here's a little, if you could have some audio for this uh, video clip. Leonard Susskind, theoretical physicist from the University of Stanford, he describes this problem from the perspective of a, an atheist or somebody who at least doesn't want to believe in God. The general view of this for most physicists is that these fine tunings are largely accidental, uh, that the constants of nature are determined by some mathematical principles which have nothing whatever to do with our existence. Impersonal, mathematical, and uh, we were just incredibly lucky that that mathematics happened to give, happened to give rise to a universe with all this kind of fine tuning. For a while, it was so. possible to believe that the laws of nature were not so precisely set as to require the hand of a creator. But then a completely new fundamental property of the universe was discovered. An anti-gravity force present in space itself. It is called the cosmological constant. And when cosmologists calculated its effect on the evolution of the universe, they realized it had to be very finely tuned indeed. The fine tunings, how fine, how fine tuned are they? Most of them are 1% sort of things. In other words, if a thing is 1% different, uh, everything gets bad. And the physicist could say, maybe those are just luck. On the other hand, this cosmological constant is tuned to one part and 10 to the 120, 120 decimal places. 
Nobody thinks that's accidental. That is not a reasonable idea, that something is tuned to 120 decimal places just by accident. That's the most extreme example of fine-tuning. It used to be. No force in the history of cosmology has ever been discovered to be that finely tuned. The cosmological constant needs to be set to one part in a trillion, 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 that the cosmological constant arrived at such a tiny value by chance seemed to be out of the question. But the alternative explanation was also impossible to contemplate. Physicists uh, did not want to accept the idea that the laws of nature might be controlled by, uh, by well, the benevolence of nature. Doesn't there should be the no reason God. why the luck should just have it that we can exist. It's too much, it's, it's a stretch, it's much too far to stretch. It seemed that hidden in the laws of nature was a value so precise that it was impossible to deny that our universe was designed. But a designed universe requires the existence of a designer, a notion that even the anthropic scientists did not want to entertain. So they don't want to entertain it, they just can't accept it, even though it's like obvious. And there's actually a far more fine-tuned feature that we know about now, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, we talked about the cosmological constant. It would like being me initialing my name on a grain of sand in the Sahara Desert and mixing it up and blindfoldly, blindfolding me and finding that same grain of sand five times in a row, right? by random chance, right? So the charges, they have to be perfectly balanced between the electron and the proton. The uh, mass has to be pretty well balanced as well between the uh, proton, electron, neutron. All those masses have to be balanced in order for complex molecules to exist. And uh, also matter and antimatter. Why is there matter and not very much antimatter in the universe? It's a huge mystery for physicists because they have exactly the same properties except charge. That's the only difference. They weigh the same, they have the same ratios of everything. Everything is identical except for charge. So where did all the antimatter go? And no one can explain that problem. Uh, they've even tested it to see if there's any slight difference that might explain why there's matter in the universe and hardly any antimatter. And um, the Alpha team was able to see uh, they measured it down to two parts in 10 billion, and they, they were identical. And all the parameters that they measured were able to measure. And so how do you explain this? He, here's the uh, spokesperson for the Alpha experiment, Jeff Hankst. And uh, he says, we shouldn't be. There should just be energy in the universe. There should be, be some light. And no one can explain to you why there's matter and not antimatter in the universe. We had many successes in understanding how things work, but we can't explain why we're here at all. We just know how things work. We, we don't know how it got started. We don't know why there's matter instead of antimatter. That's just a fundamental basic question that they just accept based on blind faith. And they're saying we're the ones with blind faith. Nobel laureate Arnold Penzias, he says, look, after studying a few of these things, and it's getting more and more complex and more and more precise, Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing and delicately balanced to pro provide exactly the conditions required to support life. In the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, and it's getting more and more absurd all the time, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, a supernatural plan. So he actually uses the word supernatural. And he's a Nobel Prize in Physics, 1990, 1992 statement here. And this is British mathematical physicist Sir Roger Penrose. He was one of the first to state the obvious, in the physics community anyway. He said, the extremely high level of fine-tuning astronomers and physicists discern powerfully suggests purpose behind the universe. And Einstein, he was 
uh, agnostic at best. He said the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is, that it is comprehensible. He was even, you know, the universe is written in the language of mathematics. It even uses imaginary numbers. You know, imaginary numbers, square roots of negative one, have real world applications, which is a setup. It doesn't have to be that way. Everything, everything that you can describe in the universe is perfectly set up for mathematical description. And it didn't have to be set up that way. And that's what really shook up Einstein. It's like, why is this world written in the, in the language of mathematics that we can understand it and comprehend it mathematically like it is? It's like, well, part of the problem is you desire to search for truth. Jeremiah says, you will seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. You actually actually want to find the truth before you actually find it. So the best counter argument, what do the guys say, the physicists who say, who are still atheistic, despite all this evidence, from the universe itself? So again, they, they still think it's turtles all the way down. I'm saying it's turtles all the way up at this point. So Stephen Hawking, he came up with something called M-theory, which M stands for all kinds of things. It doesn't mean anything. It just means like mother or magna or whatever. And he wrote in his book, The Grand Design, in 2010. He said, because there is such a law as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing, which is like a contradiction, right? You just said the universe will make itself from nothing because there is a law of gravity. Well, that's not nothing. You just started with something. <laughs> Hello? You're supposed to be a genius. Spontaneous creation is the reason why there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist, it's not necessary to invoke God to light the blue torch paper and set the universe going. Well, it is if, you, if you're dealing with our finite universe, the odds that this blue torch paper just set it going just right are pretty hard to believe. You know, even if you start with gravity, even if you start with all the fundamental laws of nature, and you start with all the basic building blocks of atoms, like quarks and things like that, which he believes that somehow this quantum computer, you know what they believe, this M theory, and he'll, he'll talk, well, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more. According to M theory, ours is not the only universe. Instead, M theory predicts that a great many universes are created out of nothing. It's not nothing again. What, what they're starting with is a quantum computer. The quantum computer, this universal quantum computer, makes a giant ocean inside of it, and the ocean is bubbling. Bubble, bubble, bubble. Each bubble is a universe. So it makes infinite numbers of universes because the quantum computer has list, existed for infinite, it had no beginning, for infinite time past. So the quantum computer has always been making universes, and ours just happened to turn out right. That's the M theory in a nutshell. And so they didn't start with nothing. They started with a computer, a quantum computer, and that can, that's eternal and infinite. And it can do anything it wants. It can make anything it wants. We'll talk about this more a little bit later. The only difference between a quantum computer and God is that the quantum computer doesn't judge you. All right? Keep that in mind. So but it's this thrill, uh, Richard Dawkins. He says, Darwinism kicked God out of biology, but physics remained more uncertain. Maybe there's some place where God was hiding. Hawking has now administered the coup de grace kicking God out of physics as well, right? And then Sir Roger Penrose said, he read the book and studied M theory also, and he said, not so fast, guys, because there's even something more precise than the, uh, than the cosmological constant. He's like, unlike quantum mechanics, M theory enjoys no observational support whatsoever. <laughs> it's a philosophy, it's not even a science. You can't test it in a falsifiable way. You just made it up because you want it to be true, right? This is not a science, guys. So we'll talk more about that too, uh, Penrose. And also, we're just talking about the universe. The simplest living thing, informationally speaking, is more complex than the entire universe. It's so much information is crammed into a living cell that uh, it would be harder to make a living cell than the entire universe as far as the constants that we know about. Oh, by the way, this is my beautiful wife, Ann Wesley, when he was born. So I had to throw that in there. So fearfully and wonderfully made. David didn't know the half of it. He didn't even know the 1% of it. He, 
So Richard Dawkins, this is how he views biology. He's a biologist, an evolutionary biologist. This is how he views evolutionary biology. He views it as the shape on the left where you gradually climb up a hill of complexity by taking one little tiny step at a time, and eventually you get to the top of a very complex hill, right? What he doesn't understand, because he's not a mathematician evidently, is that every single step you take is not a tiny little step, the same as the one that came before. Every single, single step you take up the ladder of functional complexity is exponentially harder than the one that came before. It's not linear. It's exponential, which he doesn't understand, and, and a lot of evolutionary biologists don't understand, probably because they didn't get into medical school. If you don't get into medical school, you end up in biology. Sorry, biologists, but anyway. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'll hear about that later. So, so uh, the complexity in a system, uh, in a living system, is like any other language code, like zeros and ones for computers, or the alphabet for the English language system. It's all based on the linear sequence of characters, of random characters, that you can make up anything you want. If you line them up in order and attach meaning to each of those sequences, this is how biology works. Just like the human language system or computers, zeros and ones, they all work exactly the same way, fundamentally speaking. And they all have this exponential problem with complexity, getting harder and harder as you get more and more complex. Uh, I like to illustrate it with the Scrabble board. Who would believe I just took out the Scrabble letters out of the box and tossed them on the board and they landed like this? It's okay, I, I could have placed them individually, but no one would disbelieve that that could happen, right? How about now? Maybe if I tried a few hundred times, you get cat or car or pig or fur, whatever like that, right? How about now? Right? How many times would I have to toss them on there to come? You see, so the more precise that you get, the more exponentially difficult. It's not a linear problem. It's an exponential decay curve, right? And the same thing happens with any kind of machine that you're using. The simpler a machine, the easier it is to happen on it by random chance. The more complex you get, the exponentially more difficult it is to do it by random chance. These are molecular machines that are actually built by some students at MIT based on atoms. And this is the same type of machine in your, every single cell of your body. This is what makes the energy for your cell, the ATP, ATP synthase. It's got gears, it's got rotors, it's, it has hydrogen pumps. And you're thinking that this thing can just evolve given enough time and enough random mutations. That's, it's an exponential problem. It's like cat, hat, big, if you have three letter words, it's a lot easier. I'll talk about that a little later because the ratio between three letter words is only one in 18. But as you go up to seven letter words, the ratio drops to one in 250,000. And that's uh, mul multiple combinations of any uh, seven letter sequence that you want. The ratio drops off exponentially. And so we're, you're swimming around in, in junk sequence space, random mutations, until you find another beneficial island. Well, finding another beneficial island by random walk uh, as the complexity increases, the distance between the islands, on average, increases linearly in sequence space. And so your random walk grows exponentially. And so evolutionary biology is not a linear, you know, one step after another like Dawkins imagines. It's an exponential step. Each step is exponentially higher and higher, and it takes exponentially longer and longer amounts of time, which evolutionary biologists don't uh, understand. Here's uh, just some molecular machines I think are pretty cool. This is a RNA polymerase, polymerase that decodes the messenger RNA. Oh, sorry, to make more messenger RNA. And this is how fast it works in real life. This is uh, decoding the DNA to make the messenger RNA. It just flies along. And uh, it's specifically coded. Three little letters at a time code code for, the, uh, for proteins anyway, when it's decoding the messenger RNA to make a protein sequence, three letters attached specifically to the messenger RNA to, to uh, decode the amino acid that goes next in the protein chain. And the, the system that does that, there's dozens of parts, and they all have to be precisely formed and interact precisely with each other, or else you're dead. There's no like halfway. It's either all or nothing. So this is how it works. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, 
three letters at a time and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. It's just extremely precise. It goes way beyond that. That's the simple version, right? This is also a bacterial flagellum. It spins up to uh, 100,000 cycles per minute, and it can stop within a quarter turn and spin the other direction to change directions of the bacterium. And it's water cooled. It's got 40 different parts, protein structural parts. And uh, the arguments I've seen that this can evolve from simpler structures, what it turns out is that the simpler structures in real life actually devolved from the flagellum like bubonic plague, a toxin injector. It's got a, like a little needle and a syringe, and, it's, and it puts toxins in you, in your cells. Well, that bubonic plague toxin injector actually originated from the flagellum, not the other way around. Flagellum, was start, it's the more complex starts first, and that goes downhill from there. It's a degenerative effect. Not, and there are no examples where it goes uphill when it comes to anything beyond uh, about a couple hundred amino acids. Anything that requires more than that for a structural uh, mechanical device, biological device, doesn't evolve in real life. No examples anywhere in literature, period. And you can sit down and do the math and figure out how long it would take. And it's trillions of years if you go beyond anything that requires more than a thousand fairly specified amino acids, anything that requires a thousand specifically arranged amino acid-based uh, proteins, that, that would take more than a trillion years to evolve. And you can, it's the math. I mean, you can actually calculate it. That's what got me excited. <laughs> this is just the flagellum on all its parts moving and how it, even building the flagellum, it's microengineering, how to build it, uh, from, how, to, how the cell puts it together and then sticks it through its membrane and everything. It's amazing how it it's, gets built because it has to have chaperone proteins to take the structural proteins and put them in the right spot. Right? So a bunch more proteins that get this thing built. Anyway. <laughs> now, this is a little sea creature on the left, and this is the Colosseum on the right, right? They look very similar to me, and yet one is designed and the other one isn't, right? That's not designed, that just ha happened by itself. Looks very similar to me. These are little hairs in your ear that, that make you hear, and they're like choirs. There's the short ones in the front and the tall ones in the back. <laughs> and, Right? And as, they, as the fluid gets shaken, the, the, the tall ones shake back more strongly than the short ones. But see, they, they need them all to shake together. And so what happens is that the tall ones have a, have a, a rope attached to their heads. And it, it goes from their heads to the next shortest one, and it's attached to their heads. And the next one, the next one. And so as the tall one moves back, it yanks the other ones with it. Right? And so then it signals that way, electronic signals. It opens up calcium channels and and uh, potassium channels, and that's how you hear. That's the, the signal is trans, transmitted that way. These are molecular machines, some more molecular machines. This is the mitochondria crawling along inside your cell to where the energy is needed, because it's the energy producing portion of your, of your um, cell. This is the messenger RNA going through the nuclear core. These are the ATP synthase that create the energy for the cell. The ATP is the energy building block for the cell, or the currency for the cell. So that's all along the surface of this mitochondria making energy, and it has to crawl where the energy is needed. How does it know where to crawl? Like a little worm along tubules inside your cell. This is going on in every cell in your body. This is copying your DNA with another machine that has little arms on it and it has a little motor in the front that spins like a jet engine and it's a like that and the arms grab it and make, make another strand like that and if any of those parts are missing or not working right you're dead or at least that cell is dead there's no halfway these are the chromosomes inside your nucleus and they're they're wrapped around these little balls called histones so they're compact packaging system without those things the dna would get tangled and fragment and also those histones are tagged with proteins, epigenetics, that has all that has to do with that. We're flying out through the nucleus now, 
the chromosomes line up in the middle of the nucleus? And how do they know when they're lined up properly and they're all even on, on each side and when, when is gonna, the cell division gonna start? Well, there's these other little robots that line up on microtubules that send, they, they sense exactly the right time when it's time to divide and they send the signal to both sides of the dividing cell and they, they walk like little animals down the tubules. And without these little robots, you wouldn't be able to divide properly, your, your chromosomes would fragment. So these are all necessary. If they're not there, it doesn't work. They all have to be there at the same time. And there's no simpler way to do this. This is like the most elegant way to do it. <laughs> also, here's the macrophage. How does it know where it should go through the cell to fight the infection? Well, it, it detects on the surface these proteins that send signals into it, say, hey, hey, here's the infection, come fight here. So now we're, this is the surface of the cell where the proteins are all expressed. We're flying through the middle of the cell, through the uh, cellular skeleton into the cytoplasm of the cell. And you got these microfibers forming on one end and then breaking down on the other. How does it know when they break down? Well, these other proteins come along and trim it off at just the right spot. They clip it, boom. Without that, it would all get, become a mess. Then you have the microtubules forming on one end and breaking down on the other so that the white cell can crawl like an amoeba. And these are transport robots that have little feet. They walk along the tubules with these two little feet and they pull these vesicles behind. They're like the trucks inside the cell, but they walk with two feet. This is the centriole. It has its own DNA. This is what codes for the separation of the chromosomes. This is a nuclear pore where the mRNA comes out. And the mRNA is a copy of the DNA, a working copy, that then gets decoded like we look at before to make proteins. And the proteins come off, they, and once they come off, they're not finished, they have to be modified. So they're put into uh, these tubules that modify the proteins, and they, then they get transported in these buds off by these little feet trucks to the Golgi apparatus where they're modified more on one end, and then they're, when they're finally finished and they're finished product proteins, then they get exported to where they need it, either inside the cell or outside the cell. And some of them are expressed on the cell surface that say, hey, hey macrophage, come in here. This is where we need you to fight at. So it recognizes the signal and it slips through the endothelial lining and it goes, fights the good fight. Extremely complex how it does that. This is the term for male gamete. It, it's a, it looks like a torpedo, it has multiple layers on it and then when it fertilizes the egg in the female then it starts to divide and it divides and divides and divides and it goes down the oviduct until it forms a, like a basketball that's hollow and in the middle of the basketball there's this other layer of cells that forms a flat plate like a piece of paper and in the middle of the piece of paper there's a line drawn right in the middle of the piece of paper like with a finger it looks like a line being drawn and then the piece of paper starts to fold around that line it gives it symmetry, bilateral symmetry, and it folds and folds and it folds, and extremely complicated. That's why, you know, 15% uh, or so of all pregnancies naturally abort because it doesn't fold properly. And then finally, when it does work out right, you get a baby, and it's a miracle every time. That it just let's get it's a giant origami project, right? God. <laughs> so, a few of God's favorite numbers. I think we got. Going over here, but you guys are stuck with me for three hours anyway. But so there's this there's a what's called Seth Sostak. He's a um, do you guys need a break or are you because we got two more hours, right? <laughs> I can go anyway. If you guys need to wander out, don't worry about me. I'll just be talking up here. <laughs> so Seth Sostak, he's a he's a SETI astronomer, and he says, look. If we got a radio signal from outer space and it was tagged with the Fibonacci series or some other mathematical tag, then it would indicate intelligent design. Well, what, to, what it turns out is this Fibonacci series is a very simple mathematical sequence. You take the first two numbers, 0 and 1, you add them together, and you get the next number, 1. 
You add one and one together, you get two. One and two together, you get three, et cetera. That's how you create the Fibonacci series. And the Fibonacci series has a ratio. If you divide the first number by the next number, you get a ratio, 1.61, et cetera. And it's called the golden ratio. And it's used in art, in human art. And it's, this is the golden ratio, the golden rectangle. And it was used to, by the Greeks all the time uh, to make their buildings. It's like aesthetically pleasing. Why is this aesthetically pleasing? Because it's in nature also everywhere. It's in cross sections of worms, flowers, pine cones. They all have these Fibonacci sequences on them. Galaxies, plants, shells. Uh, this is a computer generation of, anybody know what this is? This is a real thing actually. It's, it's broccoli, Romanescu broccoli. It's, it's not only a fractal, it's also got the Fibonacci sequence in it as well. So it's, it's everywhere. The human body is filled with Fibonacci sequences and golden ratios. This is a Fibonacci, this is the golden ratio. The, your hand is the, gold, is the golden ratio or the um, Fibonacci sequence as well. The ear, the face from the side, the face from the front, the sequence of your hand versus arm, even your digits. It's like, Newton will talk about later. He said, even if I just had my thumb alone, I would know there's a God. <laughs> so the late mathematician, we talked about this. He says, the enormous usefulness of mathematics is something bordering on the mysterious. There's no rational explanation for it. it did, we didn't have to be built like we are with these mathematical sequences. And so uh, it says, we neither understand this, nor do we deserve it. Right? It's just a setup job. Einstein, we already talked about him. He kind of got frustrated about this. He said, you may find it strange that I consider the comprehensibility of the world or the miracle of an eternal mystery, or a miracle or eternal mystery that we can actually comprehend the world, that it's written in the language of mathematics, basically. One should expect a chaotic world which cannot be in any way grasped through thought. The success where science presupposes an order in the objective world with a high degree, which has no a priori right to expect. This is a miracle which grows increasingly persuasive with the increasing development of knowledge. Mechanical miracles, we'll just go through these real quick. Uh, the feathers of a bird are extremely, they're, they're like tongue and groove. They're set up like Velcro. And if they aren't set up like that, then the bird wouldn't be able to fly very well because the feathers would have to be too heavy. It, or, and they would break all the time. The fact that they can separate like that means that they're much more durable these tongue and groove things. And they supposedly evolved from fish scales, but they're much more complex than scales. So the, the tech net, again, you get this exponential problem of getting more complex stuff. Here's a bombardier beetle. I'll show you a little bit. It shoots at super high temperatures and cooks, its, cooks anything that's trying to attack it, like ants. It can create a chemical reaction within its body so violent that boiling caustic liquid explodes out of its abdomen. That's in slow motion. By pulsing the jet 500 times a second, it keeps its rear end just cool enough to prevent it being cooked. <laughs> <laughs> it goes off to fight another day. Well, it, it's, uh, it, it is a, it's like a combustion engine. So it has these chemicals in two different sacks. If it mixed together all at once, it would blow up. Boom. No more bombardier beetle. It has to mix precisely, and it has to pulse it. If it just shot it up in a steady stream, it would get too hot and it would cook itself. So it has to pulse it to, so it can itself not get cooked. Right? So what happened when the first bombardier beetle evolved this by accident, came up with this, like, Oops, I shouldn't have, I should have pulsed at that time, right? Well, no more bombardier beetle, right? You, you don't get these things by accident, right? Yeah, so these are extremely complex things, 212 degrees. This is a woodpecker. The woodpecker uh, has to peck precisely because if it turned its head just a little bit, it's like a 22 bullet hitting the tree. Boom, 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 boom. So what it does is it looks at where it wants to peck and then it, it closes its eyes and it hammers that, that spot because if it left its eyes open, its eyeballs would fly out. 
right? So it has to close its eyes, like boop, and pull back and open its eyes and readjust and do it again. And it does that uh, extremely fast, 1,200 uh, times the force of gravity, 22 beats a second, right? So extremely precise. You don't get, what happened when the first woodpecker decided, oh, I want the bug, I can hear it in there, and I'm gonna go after it, and it started pecking really hard, but it was slightly unadjusted and its head blew apart. <laughs> no more woodpecker, right? What happened when the first one didn't close its eyes? No more woodpecker, right? And it's also, it it's, has brain is well padded. It's got all these fine-tuned features about it so that it can survive this heavy-duty pecking. Uh, we can go into the giraffe, but I'll probably don't have time for that. I'll just close with this metamorphosis thing. The caterpillar, it's a different creature than a butterfly. It crawls along, it's happy as a caterpillar. It has no problem being a caterpillar. It has no clue that it needs to be a butterfly. That doesn't enter its mind. It starts out as this tiny little egg, and then the egg hatches, and the caterpillar crawls out, and it goes to eat. And then inside the caterpillar, once it gets nice and big and chubby, and it's extremely happy as a caterpillar, life is good, then all of a sudden, inside of itself, these other cells start to take over called imaginal cells. And uh, it, may, it causes the caterpillar to go make a cocoon or a chrysalis, and uh, the imaginal cells liquefy the caterpillar. It completely destroys the caterpillar, turns it into goo, into sludge. There's nothing left of the caterpillar. And the imaginal cells then use the sludge as energy to recreate a new creature. And they reform the butterfly, which has no caterpillar parts. The original caterpillar is gone. And so it's like two creatures in one. And uh, really bizarre. How do you do that? You don't do that slowly. What happens when the first caterpillar sludge didn't have the proper imaginal cells, you know, and, and the, or the cocoon wasn't formed properly and the sludge leaked out, or, you know, you have to do all these things right at the same time. Also, you, you have, it has this little crochet hook thing. It, it makes this little spinneret and it hangs itself upside down. What happens if your crochet hooks weren't formed properly and you fall down? You know, if you have a butterfly hatch or come out of its chrysalis when it's not hanging upside down, let's say it's laying on the ground, the wings will not expand properly and can't fly. Right? So it has to be. All these things have to be there or else it won't work. Also, the color of the butterfly, the iridescent color, that's not a color. It's based on like refra light refraction from something that has no color. It's like a crystal sort of deal, but they're called gyroids. And the specific, you can't just randomly form these gyroids. They won't reflect any color. They have to be very precisely formed for you to produce a particular type of refractive color. And I, I think these gyroids are really cool, but they're very precisely built in order to make different types of color. And that's what makes them look metallic. And then they fly, you know, when they migrate, like the monarch butterfly starts off in Mexico, and it flies up into North America and then back down to the same exact few acres in Mexico, right? And it doesn't just do that with its own memory. It does this over like four or five generations. So the great, great grandchildren of the original butterfly knew where that original plot of land was. And to come back to that same spot, how in the world did that information get transferred to the next generation? Yeah, that's amazing. And they all end up in the same spot, this tiny little square in Mexico. So godly sarcasm to Job, he says, Job is feeling sorry for himself, and so God comes to us and says, Look, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched out the line across it? On what were its footings set, or what were its cornerstones laid? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. <laughs> right? So compared to God, we're just like worms, right? And if you don't believe me, read Isaiah, because God actually calls Jacob a worm. He says, don't be afraid, O little worm Jacob, you little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord. Fortunately, God likes worms, because he has a thing for worms. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And if there's anybody who was a worm, it was David. And so he said, God created me a new heart, a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And God said, okay, I'll remove your heart of stone 
and gave you a heart of flesh. And all the miracles that we've seen, the universe, the living body, all these th metamorphosis, all these things, Ellen White says in evangelism, the conversion of the human soul is of no little consequence. It is the greatest miracle performed by divine power. Greater than the universe, greater than living things, because what did it cost God to create the universe? Right? Oh, that's easy. What did it cost God to create us? He got his hands a little dirty, maybe. Right? Blew in some nostrils. <laughs> Done. Right? What did it cost God to create David's new heart? His life, right? He had to trade himself for that. Like we heard this morning, he missed a good sermon. But uh, that's the greatest miracle. And uh, if you desire to understand that with all your heart, then God's going to reveal that to you. So thank you very much.